This program is brought to you by the partners of A Root Awakening International. Help others find truth. Support A Root Awakening International today. How can a Jew understand Yeshua without faith? How can a Christian understand Yeshua without a Jew's perspective? Michael Rood welcomes Nehemia Gordon and Keith Johnson to explain a new initiative that is helping both sides understand the true Yeshua. Because it's the end of the sixth day, the sun is set, and this is Shabbat Night Live. Shabbat Shalom Torah fans, welcome to Shabbat Night Live with Michael Rood and Hemia Gordon and Keith Johnson. Yes, the Torah trio is back. They have an all new series about a contradiction in the Bible that is the tip of the iceberg for all new Bible study initiative that Keith and Nehemia are starting. And more details on that in just a minute. But before we get to that, we are on the second Shabbat of the month of Marheshvan on the astronomically and agriculturally corrected biblical Hebrew calendar. You can get one of these for yourself at arudawakening.tv slash calendar. Now, please Please welcome my co-host, the Chief Operating Officer of Arud Awakening International, Ted Clayton. Hello, Scott. Thank you for having me on, and welcome to everyone for watching Shabbat Night Live. Certainly, you know, this is an important uh, time. It's, uh, well, you know, the end of the month for our love gift. We'll get to that in just a second, but uh, also we are, you know, just a few days away from probably one of the most important days in the history of this country, and that is Election Day, and I know you wanted to say something about this today. Yes, indeed, Scott. Thank you uh, for that. Ladies and gentlemen, there could not be a more important time in history than right now. Ladies and gentlemen, I can't stress to you enough, it's time to get out and vote. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a privilege that we just cannot neglect. So much so, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you that uh, Michael Rood and Anna Lil Rood asked me the other day to uh, take them to the polling, uh, to the polling place. Uh, so that they could vote early. And I will tell you, it was a hot day. And we stood out for quite a while in the lines. The lines were just absolutely huge. But nevertheless, Michael wanted to get out and he wanted to vote because it's important. And by the way, Anna Lil, this was her first time to vote since she became an American citizen. So she had her first opportunity to vote. And here you can see a picture of Michael and Anna Lil. And I know you can see that vote sticker on uh, <laughs> Michael's forehead. He really wanted people to know that he had done his civic duty and went out and vote and, and, and voted. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I know if Michael were sitting here right now, he would say to you, don't stop. Get off your duffs. Go vote. Go vote early or go vote on election day, but it's the most important thing we can do. Vote your conscience, vote for the Bible, vote. It is important and we've got to do it, ladies and gentlemen. So please, please, above all else, this week, make it a priority and go vote. You know, Ted, I would have to agree with that because, you know, I'm a Canadian, I've been here, I'm on a green card now, which was, you know, we're over the hurdle of getting visas and all that kind of nonsense, but I'm not a citizen yet. I have to wait three more years before I'm a citizen and I cannot vote until that time. So, you know, I need folks to cast a vote not only for themselves and not only for their children who not, are not allowed to vote, but all those, maybe those aliens who can't vote yet and folks like me who have their green card and can't vote yet. There's a lot of people that are riding on your vote. So your vote counts for more than just one person. You may be one vote for every 20 people, really, by the time you count it. All those, you know, kids and, and aliens and, and folks on green cards that can't vote for themselves. So your vote is very, very, important for the future of this country, not only for you, but for future generations and for those folks around you that you may not even know, like me. Yeah, I bet you didn't know that I couldn't vote. So there you go. And one thing I, I want to stress to folks is polls don't have to be real. They can be manipulated. So don't worry about the polls and don't, uh, don't worry about fear. Don't worry about fear. Just go vote. It's the most important thing you can do as an American citizen. 
Indeed, indeed. Well, you know, one of the most important things that we have for our ministry, Ted, is uh, testimonies of those whose lives have been changed. Uh, speaking of changing lives with a vote, you can change lives with uh, giving to a ministry, and we'll get into that in just a second as well. But uh, here is a video from uh, Damon and Debbie. They wanted to show just how much uh, your support means to them uh, through Shabbat Night Live. Take a look. Hello, my name is Damon, and this is my wife, Debbie. We spent 30 years searching for answers that we couldn't find in the church. They were either explained away or they just were not answered at all. Eight years ago, my family started on a journey looking and searching for the truth. We found a Messianic synagogue an hour away from where we lived, and we just went from one set of man-made religion and traditions to another. Someone in the synagogue offered to have a Thursday night Bible study, and he said he had videos of the Spring and Fall Feast by Michael Rood. Who was this Michael Rood fellow? We came across Shabbat Night Live, and we were hooked. The Apostle Paul finally made sense to us. We started our own fellowship. Uh, we joined the Aviv Fellowship, and we became ambassadors uh, with the Root Awakening as well, and because we wanted to help others find truth. Shalom. All right, so that's Damon and Debbie, and obviously their lives have been changed, and uh, that's all thanks to you. And we say that because you know we may sit here behind, you know, in front of a camera and and say all kinds of things. And Michael has the teachings, and we do all that we can, but we can't do anything without folks' support, uh, can we, Ted? I mean, we really can't do anything. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. You are what make this ministry happen. As Michael said, you are our sponsors. And we need your assistance. We need your help. First of all, more than anything else, we need your prayers. Because when you pray, it uplifts us and it makes us able to do more. But also, we need your financial support. Because, you know, this is coming toward the end of the year now. And uh, toward the end of the year, we do our planning for our following year. Michael's going to be back. He's going to be better than ever. He's going to be teaching more and more. And he wants me to assure you that that's the case. He's just still recovering uh, from his stroke, but he will be back. And we need to make plans. And ladies and gentlemen, Michael needs you to stand with him today, now. So please, please, whatever the Almighty leans on your heart, please give today. Indeed, that is an excellent message. And uh, regardless of political situations or whatever, that doesn't matter. The ministry must go forward. There's been, you know, it's been 2,000 years. There have been lots of governments in places and a lot of different places. That doesn't matter. What matters is that the word goes out. And so regardless of what happens around you, keep your focus on Yehovah. And in fact, Bill Cloud, uh, starting in November, has an, a message for us uh, regarding that. Uh, and speaking of which, this is our last opportunity, the last weekend, last couple of days to get the October love gift. And this is also from Bill Cloud. Uh, this is called The End Is Not Yet. How fitting. <laughs> and, yeah, indeed. And that 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 message is again, uh, The End Is Not Yet. And that is only a couple days to get the love gift. We're going to have a, a message about that in just a second. But thanks for joining us today, Ted, and for that all important message you gave today. Absolutely. All right. Well, Michael Rood welcomes Nehemia Gordon and Keith Johnson next to explain an all new initiative that is helping both sides, that is Jew and Gentile, understand the true Yeshua. Stay tuned. It's no secret that 2020 has become the most unpredictable and the most disturbing year in recent memory. But the question is, what is our role as believers? Michael Rood welcomes Bill Cloud for The End Is Not Yet, a special edition love gift teaching about what is going on in our world and what you can do about it. In a very short time, we are going to have to be making certain decisions that are going to affect the outcome, not only of this nation, but of this world. And so as the servants of the Almighty, it is very important that we seek His will. The End Is Not Yet is an exclusive teaching you won't see anywhere. The only way to get it is to receive it as our gift to thank you for your support. Donate a $50 love gift and we'll send you The End Is Not Yet on DVD or Blu-ray. 
or for a donation of $100, we'll send you the teaching plus a tall latte coffee mug inscribed with the Hebrew name of Yehovah and Michael Rood's new Apostles' Creed printed on a cozy five-foot micro-fleece blanket. Or as a special offer for a donation of $300, we'll send you The End Is Not Yet, the latte coffee mug with the Hebrew name of God, the New Apostles' Creed blanket, plus a canvas print depicting ancient worshipers going up to Jerusalem for the fall feasts. These gifts are available only in October and supplies are limited. Make your donation now and receive the $50 gift, the $100 gift, or the $300 gift. Remember, this offer ends October 31st and supplies are limited. Thank you for your donation to A Rude Awakening International. Call now to receive your gifts, 888-766-3610, or get your gifts online at monthlylovegift.com. The Chronological Gospels Bible is changing lives all over the world, putting everything the Messiah did in exact chronological order and explaining the behind-the-scenes truth of what the Messiah did, when He did it, and why. The timing of it all means everything. And now, the Chronological Gospels can be easier on your eyes. The larger print edition features 40% larger type, and every page appears exactly the same as the original, so you can follow along with others who have the regular size version. The Chronological Gospels larger print edition also has wider margins to write notes, and the premium quality paper means you can highlight without soaking through. Plus. The larger print edition lies flat, so you can teach without having to hold the book open. The Chronological Gospels larger print edition is a big and beautiful coffee table book, measuring a full 12 inches tall and 9 inches wide. Study the Bible with clarity and ease. I love the size of this book. This is nine by 12. The paper is, is perfect because it doesn't bleed through when I write on it. I can mark it up and I always make notes in all my Bibles. Everything is the same place as it is on the smaller version and I can just stand back and I can teach from it and it's just, it's the perfect size. I pray thee, of whom speaks this prophet? Order the Chronological Gospels larger print edition by phone or online. You'll get 40% larger type than the original. Call 800-788-7887. That's 800-788-7887. Or get the Chronological Gospels Bible larger print edition online at arudeawakening.tv slash large. For the past 20 years, I've lived in the land of Israel, and I've had many occasions to de eat in the home of Orthodox Jews and on Shabbat, as the two hollow loaves were brought out, representing the double portion of manna that fell from heaven, and that we would not need to be collecting manna the next day, but his provision is there for us. And as they said the blessing, Baruch Atah, Adonai, Eloheinu melech ha'olam, homotzi lechem min ha'aretz. I, of course, know the uh, Adonai is really Yehovah. I know that. And then as they took the cup and said, Baruch atah Yehovah, Ele, uh, uh, Adonai, Eloheinu melech ha'olam, berei pari hagafen, I would sit at that table and I would recognize and understand that what they are doing, this is what was done from the time that the Melech Zadik brought forth bread and wine to Abraham. And Yeshua said, this represents my body, which is broken for you. This cup represents the renewed covenant in my blood. As often as you do this, wherever you do it, you do it in remembrance of me. The remembrance of them are all around. And this is what the Almighty put in place for us to understand. And this is why Yeshua said, Abraham saw my day and rejoiced. We do this in remembrance of him. Shabbat Shalom.
20 years ago, I asked Nehemiah Gordon to come over to my apartment in Jerusalem. I had a problem that I needed to discuss with someone who was uh, familiar with, an expert in the ancient languages of the Bible because I had a situation that I, I could not discuss with anyone else. It was a, a situation that I knew that what I was reading in my English version of the Bible didn't make any sense and it was concerning what Yeshua was saying uh, and this was just uh, two days before his crucifixion. This is a, a crucial moment, an absolutely pivotal moment, and I needed to ask his opinion on it. And what happened because of that is that it led Nehemiah on a journey into the Hebrew Matthew, the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew. And, uh, and he came back over to my house and he made this statement. He said, you've gotta listen to this. And he read this out and translated it uh, in, in English. And he said, what Yeshua says here is absolutely brilliant. And I realized I had never heard a, a Protestant or a Baptist or preacher ever say anything that Yeshua said was absolutely brilliant but I knew that he understood what Yeshua was saying. And to him, it was absolutely brilliant. And I was, I, I, you know, I was just spellbound by that. It's like I have never expected a Jewish scholar to say anything that Yeshua said is absolutely brilliant, but he understood it. A short time after that, uh, Keith Johnson uh, came and stayed with us uh, uh, for the Feast of Shavuot. Uh, he came over to Jerusalem uh, and I introduced him to Nehemiah Gordon and that began a lifelong friendship that continues to this day and now we know that, that Keith has now gone over to Israel he has gone to Hebrew University to learn Hebrew, and the two of them have been delving into the Hebrew Matthew, the Hebrew Gospels, and they are now producing a teaching series on the Hebrew Gospel Pearls. Ladies and gentlemen, we have with us Nehemiah Gordon and Keith Johnson. Hello, Michael. Shalom, it's hey, good Michael. to have you here. And, yeah. uh, and, and uh, Keith is with us virtually here. Uh, and Merry Covidmas to you. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to be with you guys. You know, the last time I was in the studio and Nehemiah was on the screen, and I mm. thought, wow, that's really cool how he gets on the screen. I want to do what Nehemiah does, so I'm on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, that, that's right. We yeah. we really kind of introduced this uh, yeah. uh, to our audience, a Root Awakening audience, at our uh, Shavuot event this year. Mm -hmm. And so we have been together for Shavuot, really, for, you know, this is uh, the 20th year, I believe it is, the 20th mm -hmm. year. Well, well Michael, the, the process that Keith and I are going through now of sharing the Hebrew Gospel Pearls really did begin begin with you coming to me and asking me this question. And I looked in all the Greek manuscripts and they didn't solve the problem. And then I found out there was a Hebrew version of Matthew published by a professor in America called George Howard. Uh, we actually have his book here. This is the second edition from 1995. It's called the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew. The first one in 1987 was, was uh, went to, into even more detail. And uh, it, in a sense, this is the culmination of that process. I don't know if you remember this, Michael, but when I first laid out to you all the information that became my book, The Hebrew Yeshua Versus the Greek Jesus, on Matthew 23, I had, right. I had piles of papers and I was presenting to you different, different uh, texts. And at the end, I said, Michael, I want to give this to you. You must share this with your people. And what I remember you saying to me is, you know, Nehemia, I can't go to my people and tell them I read a Hebrew manuscript <laughs> from, you know, the Middle Ages. No, no one's going to believe that. And I can't talk about the Pharisees because that's not my background. Mm -hmm. What you're talking about the Pharisees is, is, is something you know from personal experience. And I said, Michael, I can't write that book. If I write that book, I would be tarred and feathered. I would lose family members who would no longer talk to me. I would lose friends. And you know what? All of that came to pass. Mm -hmm. I have family members who will no longer speak to me. Uh, I have one cousin who, uh, 
who, who tells people, you know, Nehemiah has secretly converted to Christianity, and which is not a compliment in the Jewish world. And, and, <laughs> and, and all of this yeah. is, um, I knew there would be consequences, but in the end, after praying about it, I realized, okay, if Michael isn't going to share this with people, I have to. I ended up writing this book, The Hebrew Yeshua versus the Greek Jesus. Keith and I later wrote a book together, A Prayer to Our Father, mm -hmm. on uh, what's mm -hmm. called the Lord's Prayer in Hebrew. And... Uh, we did an uh, open door series talking about a lot of this stuff. And uh, finally, we ended up doing a series together, Keith and I, called Torah Pearls. And we went through each one of the weekly portions talking about me from my Jewish perspective, my Karaite Jewish perspective, Keith from his um, Methodist, formerly <laughs> Methodist perspective now. And, and then we did Prophet Pearls on the, on the portions read in the synagogues on the prophets. And I remember after that, we were in Jerusalem, and we were standing outside looking over the, uh, the valley, which is called the Valley of the Cross, the other side of the Israel Museum and the, uh, and the Knesset. Mm -hmm. And Keith said, what should we do next? And I said, we should do Hebrew Gospel Pearls. That was five years ago. And now, but the time wasn't ripe. For us, it wasn't the right time. I don't know that we'd reached the right level of, I can speak for myself, ha had reached the right level of spiritual maturity. Uh, now the time is finally ripe and we've begun the process. <laughs> and all I can say, Michael, is it really did start with you. And, I, and, and you've been significant at significant times, including this time that we're together. Because as you mentioned, it was Shabuot where we talked about uh, everything that was going on. And we launched Hebrew Gospel Pearls Shabuot at your studio. Four years ago in 2016, I called Ted and I said, Ted, listen, I want to do something called the Red Letter Series. And he says, well, come into the studio, Michael. You allowed me to come into the studio, launch the Red Letter Series. That was just a what I call a, an appetizer for Nehemiah and I to get to this place. Because mm -hmm. what we're doing now, I, and I want to say this right now, no one in the world is doing what we're able to do right now. And it's because of Nehemiah's expertise which you tapped into all those years ago. Now he has 28 manuscripts of the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew. And as I like to say, the people who care about Matthew can't read it, and the people who can read it don't always care about it. So here we found this man who can read it, and if I can say cares about it from the perspective of it being an ancient text, and the pearls that are coming as a result are life-changing, and I'll continue to say, and I've said it on the air, and I'll say it again, thank you, Michael, for asking the question. Well, uh, as you, you remember, Keith, uh, when we did the Open Door series, we were together out in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and it was there that Nehemiah uh, showed me the photograph that he had taken mm -hmm of an ancient Hebrew text of the Gospel of Matthew, and that solved the, the problem of uh, a, a situation that I laid out, and Nehemiah and I uh, traveled uh, 42 cities in America doing Raiders of the Lost Book, uh, discoveries in the ancient Hebrew text of the Gospel of Matthew. Mm -hmm. And the treasures that he brought out during that uh, that. Um, you know, that, that progression, those 42 cities, the real culmination of that was the photograph that he showed me. And when he showed me that photograph, then I said, I have got to go to press with the chronological gospels. I had spent mm -hmm. my, my whole life on it and uh, it was just for me. It was just to put every incident in the life and ministry of Yeshua in chronological order mm -hmm. so I'd understand the context, uh, right. the land, the language, the context, all all these things that are essential in, in knowing. And when Nehemiah found those ancient Hebrew manuscripts and laid this out, that's when I said, okay, I'm going to go to press with this because the world needs to know what Nehemiah has found because this is a, uh, this is a problem that has plagued the Christian world. Uh, the, the Jewish scholars know about the problems that we have with our English versions and with our Greek versions, but we find that the answer was in the Hebrew. Can we jump Hebrew into Matthew. that? Like jump right into okay. it and talk let, about it. Let's, let's do it's, that. It's Matthew chapter one, verses 16. And, uh, and really the, the problem there is that you have a genealogy for Yeshua. Well, it's not clear that it's for Yeshua. Mm -hmm. A genealogy <laughs> given in Matthew and a genealogy given in Luke. And they're completely different genealogies. Mm -hmm. One of them has uh, Yeshua descended through um, through uh, Solomon, the son of David, and the other has him descended through Nathan, the son of David. 
So mm -hmm. how is it there's two completely different genealogies? And I don't know if you're aware of this, Michael, as we were researching this for the Hebrew Gospel Pearls, I found out that Augustine of Hippo, the man who is known in the, in the Catholic world as St. Augustine, really one of the great Christian writers uh, of, the, of the early church, he actually lost his faith as a young man because he was studying and he got into a debate and somebody pointed out to him, wait a minute, you know, you're telling us that there are these, um, you know, Jesus is, is the descendant of, of David, but there's two different genealogies. And he stopped believing as a young man because of that. And it wasn't until later that he finally was able to reconcile it. And the way he reconciled it, quite frankly, I think most people would say is unconvincing. Um, but it was something for him to grab hold of where he could say, okay, mm -hmm. yes, there's what appears to be contradiction, but the contradiction is, um, you know, is, 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 is solvable. But his initial response was, um, wow, Matthew and Luke just made up a bunch of names and they made up two different lists of names. Mm -hmm. And that was his initial response. Later, he came up with different solutions. Uh, one solution was to say that the Luke is the genealogy of Mary. Why? Right. Because he's desperate. He's got to come up with some answer. Right, and that's what's taught yeah. in theological cemeteries all over the world today. <laughs> that very same fabrication that, yeah. that, uh, mm. that, that doesn't hold any weight whatsoever. Well, and there's not really any proof of it. The right. other explanation that came up, and this is extremely convoluted, so bear with me. Oh, I'll, wait. I'll, <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll give you the brief one, a brief version. So in the, in the Torah, we have this principle called leveret marriage. If right. a man dies without... Uh, a son without a child, then his brother or kinsman, we see this in the book of Ruth, it's actually a mm -hmm, kinsman, mm -hmm. will marry the widow if she agrees and then raise up a child, not on his own name, but on the name of his deceased brother. So a man named Sextus Julius Africanus explains, Matthew's the genealogy of Joseph's biological father, Jacob, while Luke is the genealogy of Joseph's legal father, Eli. That Ailey and Je jo uh, um, uh, Jacob were kinsmen or brothers, and then it even get, it gets a little bit more convoluted because they're obviously not brothers by their father because we know their father's names. Mm -hmm. So they're what's called uterine brothers. That is, they have the same mother but a different father. So <laughs> this is what we call in Hebrew um, the Sheminiot uh, Ba'avir. Um, which roughly translates as a uh, um, mental gymnastics, mm -hmm. right? And they're so <laughs> desperate to try to explain this that they're coming up with these convoluted scenarios that would explain why there are two completely different lists. Certainly, from after David on, the lists are, are, are by, by and large completely different. Now, I heard you teach in 42 cities, 42 venues in the U.S. in 2005. I was teaching my information about the Hebrew Yeshua versus the Greek Jesus. Mm -hmm. And you would, in your introduction, you would lay out this problem. You talked about how you had a $10,000 challenge mm -hmm. to answer the problem. And your explanation was based on the Aramaic. I'll let you just briefly explain what that Aramaic is. And then I'll show you what the Hebrew has. Yes, the, uh, the, the $10,000 challenge was something laid down by the rabbis. I still have that sheet of paper that was given to me by a rabbi as I entered the uh, Jaffa Gate in the old city of Jerusalem. Okay. And it just happened to, you know, I, I could have used the $10,000. <laughs> it was a $10,000 reward for any Christian who could answer these uh, problems in the Christian Bible. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I went back years later and found one of those rabbis and I said, it took me an entire week to answer mm. the first nine questions. It took 17 years before I had the answer to the last one. And I laid okay. it out and uh, they said, you know, you can't collect on the 10,000. I said, I know it's not in the Christian Bible. It was in the Hebrew Matthew, right. which is in the uh, archives of Jewish scribes. Yes. Now, um, the, the Aramaic solution is to say that when it says uh, and I always confuse this. So what it says there in the Greek is Joseph, the the, give, the, the husband of Miriam. Right. That, that's, the husband of Miriam. Yeah, that's what it and says in King James. And some people are suggesting that the Aramaic could be translated Joseph, the father of Miriam. Mm -hmm. uh, I looked at the Aramaic. I found that completely unconvincing. Uh, the word there, guvra, is, usually means the husband. 
right? Literally means the man of, and in Hebrew especially, and in Aramaic, when you say someone's a wife, there actually isn't a word for wife. You say the woman of so-and-so, and husband is the man of so-and-so. Mm -hmm. So I didn't find that convincing, but I was sitting in the basement of the National Library of Israel, and I came across a manuscript of Hebrew Matthew, where instead of saying Joseph, the husband of Miriam, it said Joseph, the father of Miriam. And what I did at the time is there was an analog uh, manuscript reader. I took an old phone and I took a, you know, it wasn't even like a smartphone, and I took a photo of the screen, and that's what I showed you in 2011. It was, so, so this is, the manuscript was photographed, turned into a microfilm, put up on a screen, and then I photographed what was on a screen. Right, but you can clearly see in black and white, or it's like gray in different shades of gray. Um, it said, Joseph, the father of Miriam. Michael, this last uh, summer, about a year ago, I was able to travel to Oxford University. And I held in my hand one of those two manuscripts, actually, two manuscripts of Hebrew Matthew that have Joseph, the father of Miriam. And I want to actually show the people here. Um, we'll throw this up here on the screen. Uh, this is the manuscript uh, it's called Manuscript Oppenheim, uh, Additional Manuscript 111, Folio 77V. And you can see here, it says, uh, I'll put it right here. Um, so it says here, Joseph, the last word on the line, and the next word on the first line is Avi Miriam, father of Miriam. And it says, uh, Am Yeshua, the mother of Yeshua. So, uh, I found this in two manuscripts. One of them I was able to finally hold in my hand. Mm -hmm. And I did actually something else that I want to show the audience here. This is what's called a stack photo. I bought a $5,000 camera. And on the $5,000 camera, you can do something <laughs> where it, with a macro lens, you are able to take 100 photos in a series. Each has a very thin layer of, uh, of what's um, visible, of what's in focus. And that's why you need a hundred of them. And then it takes those hundreds and combines it into a single photo. So this is at ultra high resolution where you Incredible. can see the first word on the second line is Avi, father of, and the second word is Miriam. So now we have high resolution definitive proof <laughs> that there's two manuscripts. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, here's one of them and there's another one is in New York. I haven't been able to photograph it yet, but we have the black and white photo. Mm -hmm. um, they actually sent me a color photo in fact. Um, but, but I haven't been able to hold it in my whole, uh, own hands yet because that library has uh, been, uh, is actually undergoing renovations. But as, so, as soon as this uh, pandemic ends and the library reopens, <laughs> God willing <laughs> soon, I hope to go there and travel and, and actually photograph it. So here we have the answer, Joseph the father of Miriam. And so that gives us exactly what Matthew recorded, 14 generations from Abraham to David, David to the carrying away into Babylon, and then from the carrying away into Babylon until Messiah. So you have the 14 yeah. generations, you have Yeshua's own only earthly parent, which is a direct descendant of King David through Solomon's line, mm -hmm. and yet Joseph, her husband, which is later on in uh, in Matthew one, mm -hmm. Joseph, her husband, we see his lineage that his father's name is Eli, mm -hmm. right, and then goes back to King David, but through Natan. So, in other words, Luke is the genealogy of uh, Joseph, the stepfather. The, the the husband of Miriam, right, right, and mm. uh, uh, Mar Matthew is the genealogy of Joseph, Avi Miriam, the father of Miriam. Now, the plot thickens.
We've talked about this before, but now I'm going to share something that I hadn't shared before. Can I do that, Keith? 100%. Beautiful. Okay. So, um, so as I was uh, uh, looking at this a number of years ago, one of the things that George Howard says in his book is he says, um, when Shem Tov copied Matthew, he interspersed it with his own comments. And I've actually had people say, well, how can we trust this? It was written by, a, it was copied by a rabbi. Maybe he changed things. Not at all. When this rabbi copied the manuscript and he wanted to make his own comments, he always introduces the comments with Amar Hama'atik, the copyist says. Hmm. And then he could have a whole page where he gives a comment. And at the end it says, uh, uh, you know, Ad Khan, thus far. And then he shifts back to Matthew. So it's interspersed with what are called critical remarks or in Hebrew, hasagot. As far as I know, um, these haven't been systematically studied as far as it pertains to understanding the original text of Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew. And what do I mean the original text? We have 28 manuscripts. They've been copied and copied and copied since 1380, and there are errors that have been introduced in the Hebrew text on the Hebrew side. So... Um, it's important to study these critical remarks to see what the original Hebrew Matthew had, uh, in Sh Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew, I should say. Mm -hmm. So I looked at the critical remarks on this section, and one of the things Shem Tov says is he says, um, this is Shem Tov Ibn Shaprut, the rabbi who copied Hebrew Matthew in the year 1380. He says, if you look at the genealogy in Luke, it's a completely different genealogy. And this is a contradiction the Christians can't explain. And the only conclusion you can make from that is that when Shem Tov copied Hebrew Matthew in 1380, it said Joseph, the husband of Miriam, not Joseph, the father of Miriam. Okay. So what these two manuscripts preserve here, where they have Joseph, the father of Miriam, actually don't come from Shem Tov. They're an independent witness to the gospel in Hebrew that preserves what apparently wow. is the original text here, Joseph, the father of Miriam. Incredible. I mean, <laughs> Incredible. this is huge stuff. Uh, now, 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 Keith, I, I've got to ask you to, to uh, interject on this because mm -hmm. uh, people have been saying for a long time, I mean, uh, since we did Raiders on the Lost Book, okay, now you're bringing in this Jew, this anti-Christ Jew, bringing him in uh, to, uh, to uh, interpret the, the Gospels, mm -hmm. and certainly he's going to be twisting things and, mm -hmm. and turning people away from Yeshua, and mm -hmm. so now you're doing the Hebrew Matthew with him, and so I, I want to get your perspective and Nehemiah's, and why are you doing this, okay? My, my and and, I, and I, know, I know Nehemiah to be uh, the most honest scholar that I've ever met, okay? But, mm -hmm. you know, I, I need a second witness here. I will tell you something, Michael. Uh, you must be reading my emails in terms of, have you been reading the emails that I get from people that say, how could you possibly be spending your time working, and uh, literally, emails, He's an antichrist. And, and, I'm, and I'm saying to them, I'm saying, so when we're looking at something that is independent of spiritual background, religious background, looking at a text, and, and you're talking about an honest scholar, a person who's saying, what does the text say? Mm -hmm. The number one thing that I have learned from Nehemiah Gordon over the last 18 years is I'll ask him a question and he says, let's look at it. No, no, Nehemiah, just give me the answer. No, let's look at it. And this went on year after year after year. The first time that he came to me with the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew, we ended up dealing with the, the Lord's Prayer, and that was an entire process. Mm -hmm. What happened for me was is that, look, it wasn't good enough for me to ask Nehemiah what he saw. It was better if I could see it for myself. By me seeing it for myself and then comparing and contrasting with him, the treasure chest has opened up, Michael. It yeah. has opened up in a way that for me and my background, I can come to something like what you just brought up, and it fixes an issue that could not be fixed. It couldn't happen right. unless we had the opportunity to do what we've said for years is come to common ground and try to find a way that we could walk in that common ground. And by the way, the secret is this. This is the secret's out. Now, Hemia told me initially, no New Testament studies, he says, <laughs> and none of that Jesus stuff, he says. We're just going to stick to the Tanakh. And then he calls me on the phone and he whispers, can we study the gospel of Matthew in Hebrew? <laughs> Changed my life. 
Now, Michael, here's the good news. Yeah, and it's uh, for a reason because uh, you know Nehemiah has been around Christians long enough to know that uh, they'll they'll do anything to try to convert uh, a, a Jew. Absolutely, but here's here's what's exciting, and this is what I want to I want to sh- just make one little shift because it, this is related to you. I came to your office, Michael, some years ago, and when I came in your office, you had a sheet of paper on the back of your office wall. And, and you, every time I came to your office, this sheet of paper was on the back of your wall. And then finally I came to your office one time and you gave me a gift. And I was reading this gift last night, and I think it's related to what Nehemiah and I are doing. And I want to read something from this gift. Because as we go forward in the Hebrew Gospel Pearls, we're getting to a section where we're going to need this as a resource. Can I read the first part of this real quick? Say on. It says, to key. It has been a pleasure to work with you this past year on the open door and look forward to much fruit in the future. Keep in touch. I do hope to see you before the smoke clears and after Michael Rood, number 98 of 1,000. This is the hard bound copy. Mm-hmm. And Michael, I'll tell you something. As a result of what Nehemia has done, we've gone through now seven uh, episodes of the Hebrew Gospel Pearls. And there are pearls and pearls and pearls and pearls and pearls that are coming up. The next episode we're working on, this gets to be one of our resources, because now we're going to talk about the life of Yeshua as an adult, not baby Jesus, Uh (laughs) like you say. We're going to be talking about him as as an adult, and I want Nehemiah to tell the people the resources that we're using, because the resources alone are absolutely amazing. And one of them, I just want to let everyone know, the Chronological Gospels will be a part of the future study, starting with episode eight. Yeshua and John mm-hmm. at the baptism. But Nehemia, please tell them about a couple of the things that we're using. Well, so so the original idea when we set out to do this was we were going to look at Hebrew Matthew. Um, what had happened is earlier this year, um, it's actually something I've been working on for nearly 20 years, um, <laughs> was to transcribe Hebrew Matthew. Now, now Howard did that based on his uh, nine manuscripts. Mm-hmm. I wanted to transcribe it based on uh, all 28 manuscripts. And then uh, what I wanted to do is get it pointed, that is, add vowels, so somebody who didn't know Hebrew could just pick it up and read it. Maybe they wouldn't understand every word, but if you don't aren't fluent in Hebrew, it's very difficult to read a Hebrew text without vowels. So, so I had it uh, pointed by one of the top pointers in Israel, meaning there's people whose job it is, that's their profession, to add vowels to texts. Mm-hmm. And for years I've been looking for someone to add the vowels to the text, and every time I would find someone who was an expert in this type of uh, pointing, um, the response was, well, that's New Testament. I want nothing to do with that. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I finally yeah. found a man whose name was Ben-Hur. And I thought, okay. <laughs> Judah Ben-Hur? It, uh, it wasn't Judah Ben-Hur, <laughs> but his name was Ben-Hur. And it turned out he had pointed thousands of books. And I saw him on a program on Israeli television, and I immediately contacted him. And he said, oh, absolutely, I'll do that. I do all kinds of books. Wow. To me, and, he, and he had a question. Do you want it to be in Old Testament Hebrew? Do you want it to be in Second Temple Hebrew? Do you want it to be in Medieval Hebrew? Right? There's different ways to point it, hmm. and the vowels are different. So we had to make decisions on that as well. Now, that was what I expected to use, the Hebrew text of the Gospel of Matthew, uh, Howard's book, and the 28 manuscripts I have that I've been collecting for 20 years. Uh, I now have photographs of all 28 manuscripts. Um, Finally, the last two were digitized and put online, and I was able to download them. And so on my computer, I have all 28 manuscripts. One of the sources I had no anticipation that I would use is a book written by a rabbi. And this came actually from an audience member who wrote to me, and he said, if you're going to look at the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew from a Jewish perspective, you should consider this book that was just published a year ago. Now, it was originally written in 1879, and it was originally written in Hebrew, but it was translated a year ago by Yale University, and uh, it's called The Bible, the Talmud, and the New Testament in English by Rabbi Elijah Tzvi Soloveitchik, Uh, and it is considered the first Jewish commentary on the New Testament. That up until then, there were Jews who made comments in the New Testament, like, um, like uh, Shem Tov, but it wasn't actually a commentary, the earlier Jews. He's actually going through the New Testament and saying, okay, what does this mean? 
right? Not in order to tear it down, not in order to argue with Christians. I want to know what this means. I want to explain this from a Jewish perspective. So the first Jew to make a commentary on the New Testament on Matthew and Mark and possibly Luke, he, he made a, uh, his commentary. Here we have Matthew. Now, um, uh, as soon as I heard the name Soloveitchik, I said, well, I mean, that's the family, a famous family of rabbis that are cousins of my family. I thought, there's no way this man is a cousin. I've never heard of him. And I've never heard that one of my cousins wrote a book on a commentary on the Gospel of Matthew, the, the first Jewish commentary in the Gospel of Matthew. So I order the book and I read it. And then I, say, I find out who he is from the introduction. And I go on to a, a website where you can uh, track genealogical things, and, which also cross-references with records I have. And I find out he's my second cousin five times removed. And, and in the introduction to the book, they, they, uh, the translator talked to the family, um, the family historian. And the family historian had stories about all these different great rabbis. Just to give you an idea of who these rabbis are, the leading rabbi of the 20th century in American Judaism was a, a, a nephew or something, of a great nephew or something like that, or cousin of this rabbi Soloveitchik. He was uh, Rabbi uh, Joseph uh, Soloveitchik. He's referred to in American Judaism as the Rav, the rabbi. Mm. So if you say the Rav and you don't say who, you mean that Rabbi Soloveitchik, not this one, um, the, the, the great nephew or something. And, um, and so this is a very prominent family of rabbis. Um, and they asked then about this rabbi to the family historian. He says, oh, we don't talk about him. Mm. Now, in the introduction, there was something that really moved me. And he writes in the introduction, uh, this is Rabbi Elijah Tzvi Soloveitchik writing around 1879. He says, I know that I will not escape criticism from both sides. Right? Mm. He's writing a commentary. And, and let's back up. There are Jews who wrote commentaries in the New Testament. Those are Jews who converted to Christianity. He's the first Jew who remained an Orthodox, in fact, an ultra-Orthodox Jew who wrote a commentary. And so this was extremely controversial in its day. My Hebrew brethren will say, he writes, what happened to Rabbi Eliyahu? <laughs> Yesterday he was one of us, and today he is filled with a new spirit. A new spirit is meant not as a compliment. <laughs> it's an insult. Mm -hmm. And my mm -hmm. Christian brethren will say, this one who is a Jew comes to reveal to us the secrets of the gospel? How can we accept, accept that he speaks correctly and a true spirit dwells within him? He goes on, these two extremes are really saying one thing. That is, it cannot be that what he is speaking with his mouth is what he believes in his heart. On this criticism, my soul weeps uncontrollably. Mm. Only God knows, and God is my witness, that in this I am free of sin. And Michael, mm -hmm. this is my second cousin five times removed, who 150 years ago went through some of the same things that I've gone through. Yeah. Yeah. where I'm being criticized by the Jewish side, saying he's a secret Christian who's really out to convert the Jews. Mm -hmm. And then from the Christian side, he's, he's really a covert counter-missionary. His mm -hmm. goal is to get the people to deny Yeshua. Mm -hmm. And same thing this rabbi went through 150 years ago. I mean, literally some of the same statements. Uh, mm -hmm. I have a story I tell. I, I wrote a, a piece years ago called The Ass Speaks Out. And, and what inspired it was a man who told me his, what happened to him. He was in a Messianic synagogue, and he told his rabbi he was going to go hear me speak. And the rabbi said, you can't hear Nehemiah speak. He's not filled with the Holy Spirit. Mm. And this man responded. He said, if God could use Balaam's ass to speak the truth, surely he can use Nehemiah. <laughs> and uh, so literally the same thing. He's not you know, filled with the Spirit, and how can we hear anything he has to say? So I've been reading this book, Michael. And I think it's profound. Um, I'm actually told it's sold out on Amazon. Uh, it was, it's been around for over a year, and it was <laughs> you know, little, little sales here and there, two, three books, and all of a sudden we do our uh, Hebrew Gospel Pearls and it sells out on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh, this this is uh, this is incredible, and even uh, your your cousin who he's talking about his Christian brothers. He's yeah. there. There's no oh, yeah. no real animosity there. It's like we're mm-hmm. trying to understand each other, and he's trying to bring mm-hmm. an understanding right. to the Christian mm-hmm. world and to uh, to find common ground. This is really the theme of you and Keith for years now, Absolutely. finding common ground. And, but to hear this from an ultra orthodox rabbi. Uh, yeah. Today would be shocking, let alone in 1879. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it turns out that there's a single copy that has survived, as far as I know, of the Hebrew original of this book. This is the English translation. That copy is in Paris, and then there's a photocopy of that in uh, at, in Jerusalem, and you can mm. see it's a photocopy. It's very poor quality, but you can make out the letters. Uh, and I finally got a scan of that uh-huh. photocopy. Um, so when we first started this, I was reading it in English. Now I'm actually able to read it in Hebrew and verify some things. So, uh, uh, Michael, I got to tell you something, I, I, and you now say this over and over again. Mm-hmm. You guys asked a question that he did an entire book on the Hebrew Yeshua versus the Greek Jesus. He and I did an entire book on just the prayer that Yeshua taught. But we're only through the first two chapters of Matthew, and I guarantee you right now, there's probably twelve pearls that each of those could be a book. The kind Mm -hmm. of information that's come forward, looking specifically at the Hebrew, looking at the Greek, looking at the Jewish annotated New Testament, which is another one of our sources, Mm -hmm. looking at Nehemiah's cousin, and now being able to bring the chronological gospels there in terms of context, language, history, and context. And what we're doing that excites me more than anything is that we're allowing people to study with us, Mm -hmm. having the Mm -hmm. interlinear now where we've got the Hebrew along with the English. We put that in the, in the episode so that people can get that. And it really is, it's changing. People are studying, Michael. And, and people are studying the language and they want this information. And I just have to say, I feel humbled because mm-hmm. it's it, for, for me personal first. Mm-hmm. I wanted to be able to look at the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew and read it within the context of what I had learned in the Tanakh. And guess what? Mm-hmm. Over and over and over again, it jumps off the page. So... It is pretty amazing. Again, we're inviting people to be you're, a part you're, of it. You're taking people on the journey of discovery. You are yes. really, uh, this is not rehearsed ahead of time. You are putting this no. up on Hebrew gospel pearls, <laughs> yep. and, and you're really exploring this. I mean, yeah, it's like, uh, one of them is like, I, I saw a criticism, it was like 40 minutes on two verses, and I and <laughs> I don't have time for this. It's like, no, no, you don't have time for that, but these men have spent their entire <laughs> life to be able to bring this to you, and you don't have 40 minutes to learn uh, something a little deeper than a one-verse answer. People are looking for one-verse answers, but you guys are giving them the depth of this, and and it's all free of charge, all free of charge. But then then you do have a a second level where you're going into more depth, and that's the Mm -hmm. plus, the the Gospel Pearls Plus. So what we decided to do was uh, for each section, Shem Tov breaks up Hebrew Matthew into 115 sections. We originally said we're going to do 28 episodes on Matthew. And then we said, wait a minute, the Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew is 115 sections. Let's do an episode on every section. And then we realized, wow, this is a lot of material that we, that we want to share. And, and so the first, uh, the first episode was something like uh, an hour and 15 minutes. And then we decided, you know what we're going to do? We're going to also, for those who want to continue, because m- many people don't, that's fine. They, they want the 60-second sound bite. Mm-hmm. They're not going to get that from here. That's fine. Um, so, But for the people who want to go more in depth, we have what we call Hebrew Gospel Pearls Plus. And there we continue past our hour, hour and 15 minutes uh, for yeah. another hour or so, uh, depending on, on you know what we're sharing that week. And uh, those are actually available on my website, nehemiaswell.com, and Keith's website, uh, bfainternational.com. And we did something a bit controversial. We said, well, how do we do this? We have two different ministries. How do we share the plus <laughs> episodes? So uh, I came up with the idea that we'll alternate. One mm-hmm. week episode, all the odd numbers, because he's kind of odd, we'll do uh, on Keith's website, bfainternational.com, and all the even numbers will be on my website, nehemiaswall.com. And those who want to join my support team and get a little bit more in depth 
information. It's available. Uh, half the episodes on my site, half the episodes on his site. But then, okay, so uh, they're yeah. really going to be supporting both of your ministries by this because uh, again, this has taken decades, decades of your lives yeah. to be able to bring this forth. And and, and now with what you're doing, and, and we're going to be doing more of this. I, I've mm-hmm. got to have you guys back on uh, okay. for another episode. Yeah, we need to get through early. Good stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you know, uh, the, in the first two episodes, Michael, that we broadcast, they were downloaded over 100,000 times. Now, I don't know if it's 97 or 98% of those are people who are coming to the website or they uh, subscribe to my podcast on iTunes or whatever their favorite podcast app is, and they just listen to the first hour and 15 minutes and they're fine, but there are thousands of people who want to go more in depth, and those okay. people are coming for the Hebrew Gospel Pearls Plus, and they're writing to us and saying that they've been very blessed. Michael, right. can I say one thing? I, I, I do. I want to put, throw one thing out here. As long as we're, we're on, we're, uh, we're we're live here, all three of us. Nehemiah did do something that was very controversial. He actually didn't tell me in the first episode how we were actually going to do it, and this was the authenticity, authenticity, and the validity of the process. What we said is, we're just going to start. This was not pre-produced. Well, well, and Keith, we I'm going to have you continue the story next time because we have run out of time. <laughs> and so uh, uh, come, come back. You guys are going to be back here next week. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I encourage you uh, to join in the Hebrew Gospel Pearls. This is available uh, on the uh, on the internet, uh, the Pearls Plus to help support Nehemiah and Keith in their continuing ministries as they're doing this and they are really ramping this thing up. The production value and all is to make this something that can be passed down to posterity so that it can be spread throughout the world because this is the breaking research, the breaking revelation in the opening up of this. If you really want to understand the prophet that we are required to hear and obey, then you have to go back to the books that detail his life and his ministry. And so uh, they're, they're gonna be back with us again next week, uh, Keith and Nehemia. So <laughs> until then, shalom everyone, peace, tranquility, have a good week and we'll see you next week. Shabbat night live. Shalom Torah fans. Give this video a thumbs up and share it with a friend. Tap the subscription button and the bell icon and I promise to update weekly with in-depth biblical research. Be sure to download the new michaelrood.tv app for both mobile and home devices for even more commercial-free content.